Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy. Hey folks, welcome back to Through a Scottish Prism. Lovely to have you back. It's been a week since we last spoke. I hope you're all keeping well, everything's going fine. And I am delighted to say I am now talking to you from sunny downtown Dubai. Where in parlance, it's Scorchio, but not here where I am. Nice and air-conditioned. I hope you're well. I'm joined today by some fabulous guests. Of course, I am every week, but particularly I've got two of my my favourite ladies in the entire Yes movement are joining me for the first part of this show. Uh, and that's uh, Eva Comrie and Michelle Ferns. And we're going to have a wee chat, and I hope you're going to enjoy it as much as I know I'm going to enjoy talking to these two ladies. How are you? Very good, you thank you. You're I'm so sure. delightful to see you. You keeping well? Yes, indeed. Thank you. And you? Ah, life's a bo- life's a bo- life's so good for me, I should have a twin to share my joy. Oh, <laughs> really is. No, I'm having a great time. Um, a wee bit jet-lagged, but apart from that, we're fine. So, yeah, thanks for joining me. Um, you're, the two of you ladies, of course, I'll just make small reference to it because we're still in the middle of an election and I can't be seen to... Do that, but Eva, you're running for uh, the Equalities Convener, and Michelle, you're going for Deputy Leader of the Alapa Party, and we're getting close to um, the the conference, mm-hmm. hoping it goes ahead with COVID and one thing or another. But I just thought we'd have a general chat, maybe about the agenda and just about how things are generally going um, in in the, in the country. Um, but what issues at the moment are really getting to you, Eva? What's really you know? Oh, what's getting to me? Michelle and I could write a book about it, eh? Um, we do sometimes over what? Just do a half hour, with it. that'll do. <laughs> um, poverty, hunger, drugs, you name it. Um, one of the things we were exercised about the other day was a report from a, a soup kitchen for the homeless in Glasgow. Um, mm-hmm. where some of the customers the other night were a couple of primary school children, seven and eight year old, starving on the streets of Glasgow in 2021. It's absolutely disgusting. Um, so mm-hmm. you know, you've, you've Michelle in her hometown of Glasgow and the problems that they've got there for all that it's our greatest city. Um, and then me sitting in Clackmannanshire, the smallest local authority area on the mainland, and much of the issues that we've got are the same as Michelle sees day in and day out. Just hunger, want, poverty in a land of plenty. So frustration is not the word, let me tell you. Sorry, Michelle, but I know you totally agree with me. I'm seeing you nodding there. It's it's just... Well, unex- I mean, isn't it a fact, Michelle, that most of the ills of society, be it drug abuse, alcohol abuse, domestic violence, um, all linked to one thing, poverty, mm-hmm. or are heavily, heavily influenced by poverty? Yeah. Would you agree or disagree with that? Oh, 100% agree, and 100% agree with, with, with what Eve is saying there about what the issues are. Will be, will be more concentrated in a, in a city like Glasgow because we have 600,000 people, but there will be the same issues right across the country. The, the, the city that I was born in, Dundee, almost absolutely mirrors um, the, the city that I live in now, just on a, on a, on a slightly smaller scale. Uh, and Glasgow, because it's the biggest urban city, I guess in a lot of ways we have more than our share of, you, you know, the, the, the Glasgow effect, as it used to be known as, as a well-known uh, phenomenon. Um, so for instance, in, in, in Glasgow, we would have 11% of Scotland's children, but we've got 20 odd percent of Scotland's looked after children. You know, there, there, there are issues that particularly affect um, the big urban areas and, 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 and rural areas that will be specific to those areas, but the underlying problems will be the same right across the country. Poverty, want, insecurity, insecure debt, uh, poor housing, um, you know, um, poor educational attainment, poor health outcomes, more likely to have interaction with the criminal justice system, which I'm sure Eva will be able to give you lots of background. Mm-hmm. And Eva and I chat quite often um, about the fact that the people that we deal with are the people that are the, 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 the sharp end of, 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 of the policies that the Scottish government are, are laying down. And it's the same, peop- it's the same issues more, um, that I've been dealing with since I've been elected. The, the effects of the, the pandemic have only made that really, really more stark. In in, in my town, it's kind of like everybody was affected by the pandemic. Nobody was nobody got off scot free. 
but in some ways it was really a tale of two lockdowns, Brody, for in, in different sides of the city. Some people had to cope with no being out of their house and that was really difficult and all those issues, but uh, it's a lot more different if you're sort of like up a, you know, a nice house with a garden and a conservatory and, you know, you're, 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 you can work from home and still get paid and have a nice glass of wine. And if you're locked up at a flat with two autistic lanes and two cross and you can only go out an hour a day, you have to give up your job, you can access your childcare because you're a wider family and stuff. What you really seen was that people that were already on the margins have been really, really forced to extremes. Mm -hmm. Child poverty in mass city is going up. The attainment gap is getting bigger. Um, whatever it is that we're doing now is not working. We need a new approach. Yeah. So, Eva, you know, the government would turn around, rightly, the Scottish government, say, well, we don't have our, um, all the, the, the levers of power or economics in our hand, but surely there must be more we can be doing as a nation, um, even with the limited powers that we have just now. Well, it's about priorities, Roddy, isn't it? You know, if mm -hmm. I was just thinking about this earlier on, actually, if you were sitting in Scotland today and you were omnipotent and you had a blank sheet of paper in front of you and you were allowed to build a country and you were allowed to build a structure, a government, you know, a national, local, whatever it was, there's a whole lot of things going on now that wouldn't feature on your bit of paper when you were filling in the blanks. Um, mm -hmm. So in terms of priorities, the Scottish government actually is not getting that right by any manner of means. They've done a lot of good things although those are principally achievements under Alex Salmond, um, their current achievements, what are they doing? They're lagging behind in relation to social security. They're still not really making any serious inroads at getting some of the disability benefits transferred to Scotland because they were more interested in certain other areas of policy. Um, in terms of children's needs, they could double the child payment overnight. They're refusing to do that, despite the fact that dozens of um, child welfare organisations and charities have been pleading with them to do that, because that on its own would lift an awful, you know, a huge numbers of children out of poverty at a stroke of a pen. Um, but no, there's money allocated elsewhere to other subjects that are people's pet projects that affect a small minority of the population. Um, from my perspective as, as a lawyer, um, what I'm seeing now is exactly what I saw way back when I started work in the early 1980s. Domestic violence figures are on the up, crime is on the up, although they pretend it's going down. It's only going down because they're not prosecuting so many because people are getting fixed penalties and no appearing in court. The folk that are on remand in prison, the numbers are rocketing. There are people now on remand that were they convicted would be released immediately because they've already been on remand longer than the sentence that they could have been getting. Um, you've got thousands of hours of community service written off because it wasn't done during the pandemic. You've got a backlog in the criminal courts that might take 10 years to, to, to disappear. So, you know, the country's going to rack and ruin, but we're, we're doing press conferences every few days where we're, you know, producing this <coughs> shiny green coalition we're talking about making the country um you know greener and brighter and you know <laughs> such a happy shiny smiley place to live in scratch away the surface and what do you see joseph mm. round says in a couple of years child poverty in scotland will be 38 mm. percent it's not far from that now some areas of the, the, the country eva i think you make a really important point about the the criminal justice system the only thing that uh, you didn't mention there, I suppose, is the access to legal aid, um, which oh. is, is is almost non-existent. And if you don't have it's loads of money behind you, as well as the, the, I suppose, the, the lack of confidence for a lot of Scottish people in the separation of powers and who the legal system is actually working for um, and who is working against. Um, one of the points, so, sorry, even just the, the point that Roddy made about kind of using the powers, I think, as lifelong nationalists, we would all agree the only way to fix the problem instead of kind of mitigating against it is for Scotland to be an independent country. But I think there's an important point that we're missing there in terms of powers that we do have, that we choose not to use. You mentioned disability uh, and the handing back of PIP, I think is an absolute betrayal of disabled people in Scotland and their families and carers. Now, as a, as, as a government who's raising data as to, to, to show the, the, the country that we are capable and fit to govern ourselves well. What kind of message does that send back when powers that were devolved here in the Smith Commission, powers I have to tell you that the SNP fought hard for over every single amendment. You know, there, were, there, there was late night votes and we fought for, every, for Scotland to have the power 
over, I think it was 11 benefits to go to Scotland um, after the Smith Commission. Two, two, two parts of it, sorry if I'm going on too long, tell me. There's two parts of it, it's really important. One was administrative competence and one was executive competence. So there was an idea that in, after the Smith Commission in 2015 that the Scottish um, uh, government would need time to build the structure of the social security system that would um, uh, uh, distribute benefits um, in Scotland. There was, an, there was a, an acknowledgement that would take some time. So the, the administrative competence, which is just what it says, that you've got the competence to give out payments. The executive competence, which was the most important part, which came into force in 2020, gave the Scottish government the, the, the ability and the power to do things like amend, mitigate, create new benefits. So there was a real, there was a real opportunity in Scotland um, for the, the government to show how we were actually going to create a, a, a system that was based on dignity and respect, and not putting disabled people through the ritual humiliation of proving that they're still disabled every year to get the pittance that they get anyway. Um, um, to, to you know, to, to it's not even extra money; it's money that's needed to create reasonable adjustments. Yeah. You have to overcome these barriers every single day in your life. It's no luxury money. Um, the fact that people in Scotland were, were having to go through this and be put through this and the Scottish government has decided to hand that power back until 2024 and leave Scottish people at the mercy of the Tories is absolutely unforgivable. Absolutely. It's not the only yeah. thing that the SNP is not prepared for. Audit Scotland said themselves that the Scottish government have absolutely failed to put the work into the structures of the Scottish, Scottish social security system that would be needed to deliver um, um, these benefits. Much like independence, where is the planning? If you're telling us this is something you're going to deliver, show us your workings. Show me how you're working towards that. With so many things with the, 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 the Scottish government, they'll say the sound bites, but when you look behind the curtain to see what work is being done, it's a lot of, lot of noise and no much, no much action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, you're right enough, absolutely. Um, you touched on the criminal justice system there in legal aid. Um, it is a matter of fact that earlier this week, the, the Crown Office were advertising for new um, procurators fiscal. The starting salary with zero experience, just out of uni, no experience at all. What's the starting salary? £41,000. Straight out of uni with no experience, that's what you get as a prosecutor. On the other hand, if you want to come and work for somebody like me, straight out of uni, um, with a practice that is predominantly legal age, you'll be lucky to get half that. Yeah. But when I finish training you, I know that I've wasted a couple of years on you because you're going to walk out that door and get a job at the Crown Office, where you're going to be paid an awful lot more and have your holidays and your pension and all your other benefits. And that is characteristic of the SNP approach now and the Scottish Government approach that you bolster and you set up and you fix things that are to do with state management and state control and you forget about libertarian things like legal aid, especially in relation to, you know, another one of our pet projects, Michelle, women's rights. Um, mm. In 1980, when I started work, I was the only female working in Clipmanshire, which at the time was daunting and exciting. Um, other, other women came to work locally. Some of them did legal aid work. Um, unfortunately, because of the way that the economic climate is and because the legal aid system is just so garbage now, I am now back to being the only female in Clipmanshire that does civil legal aid work. Nobody wow. else is doing it now. There are no other women doing it. And there's not going to be any women arriving to do it. So what you'll have are, um, you know, city firms, Glasgow, Edinburgh, etc. They'll come into Clipmanshire and they'll do the work. And that's absolutely fine. The women will get a service. But local people won't get the jobs that they used to have. There won't be folk like me employing juniors and secretaries and what have you, because they'll be somewhere else and they're outsourced. So there's a huge issue in there in relation to representation, you know, libertarian issues, women's issues, a whole load of stuff that, you know, you could you could talk until the cows come home. We're not going to fix it. And yet we've got a female ex-lawyer, first minister, who must know that these things are going on. She must see that women are not being properly represented. She must see that there are lots of gaps in the justice system does she care enough to address it appropriately and do something about it? I'm not seeing any evidence of that. Well, I think she knows we're there. She certainly heard us on Thursday. Or the Parliament. I hope she did. 
As we were hearing is it the time, just as, as they were announcing that the universal credit was going to stop by 20 quid a week, which is vital to some people. I mean, it's the difference between eating and not eating for certain individuals and families. Um, they were announcing, as you were talking about earlier, ever their, their Green Deal, their, their joint thing with uh, the Green Party. They weren't talking about the disgusting. That's what they should be prioritising on. But the only thing they seem to have prioritised on is nothing to do with poverty. Um, it's uh, all to do with the, the divider of the yes movement, the gender the gender mm -hmm. issue, which I don't want to go down just now because I'll be discussing that later. Um, but in the we're, we're talking there about the, the conference coming up next week for Alipa. Now, there is, a, there is a, a resolution there to talk about poverty and how we tackle it and having a plan. Are you any of you ladies uh, planning on talking at that one? Eva? Um, oh, I, I, I don't know if I would, because I think, Michelle, you're fantastic at that. <laughs> oh, you've got to be up there. Oh, I don't know about sure. that. And, and, and that's quite sad, isn't it? Um, um, yes, I, I'm, that's horrible, isn't it? I'm an expert in poverty. I wouldn't say I'm an expert. Yeah. Certainly, I, I certainly think I know a lot of the issues. And I suppose working in a, a local authority where you, you, you're lucky in that you have the chance to work on actually developing the policies that you're going to then cost and deliver and it's, it's been being able to be in those conversations right at the beginning to start poverty proofing all of our policies as we're developing them so mm -hmm. I, there's quite a few motions that i'm more you're minded to speak on oh, but at that point you know you need to let somebody well, the one in child on. poverty for me <laughs> just interject here you know instead of talking about taking 20 quid a week away the alibi party is proposing that we add 20 quid yes to 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 the to benefits and also an annual payment of 500 quid yes universal free lunches and breakfasts to all nurseries primary secondary schools in scotland all the year round during you know holidays as well a doubling of the educational maintenance allowance to mm -hmm. assist thirty thousand school and college students from poorer families to continue in education universal free access to sports facilities an increased child scottish child payment to 40 quid a week which would help 40, 400,000 um, people in Scotland. Now, these are things worth doing. Why aren't our present government doing it? Because those are, not, those are not their priorities. Yes. Um, oh, that's people, the problem. Um, you know, what they would rather do, I suppose, um, is, is spend money on spin doctors and special advisors and you know you'll have noticed yourself already that the two green ministers are now getting an extra 30 grand a year each mm -hmm. so nice work if you can get that um so what, what you're looking at actually also in in relation to where they spend their money there was an advert last year for the scottish government again where they were recruiting lawyers and they were looking for i think 20 lawyers straight out of uni and of course they were all getting paid forty thousand a year as well so if you sat mm -hmm. and analyze the scottish government budget what you'll see is an awful lot of money goes into propping up the scottish government as opposed to looking at what the scottish government ought to be doing for the electorate of scotland um mm -hmm. you know, i think you know there are issues in relation to how engaged with politics people living in poverty actually are because a lot of people living in poverty don't vote and they don't campaign mm -hmm. because they don't have time to campaign they don't have the energy to campaign they don't have the personal resources let alone the financial resources mm -hmm. and they're almost at times forgotten i'm sorry i'm moving here a wee bit Aye. i'm losing power i can't quite reach the plug okay. i'm moving a wee bit there we go so, Bob's your uncle it's easy to ignore the people that are really suffering because they're not the ones that most political parties think make the difference in terms of who controls the votes and who's who actually puts you in power because your your swing seats if you like are what a couple of percent here and there and usually the folk that are the thinkers that are more likely to be in full-time paid employment um, or, you know, retired but with a comfortable pension that have the time to watch the telly, think about who they're voting for and like the nice green policies about, you know, renewables or wind farms or whatever else it might happen to be. Um, but, you know, folk that Michelle and I deal with on a daily basis that, that are struggling, that are skint or hungry or not in good health, they're not likely um, seriously um to be considered by the likes of the kind of 
middle class Scottish government types now um, has been particularly influential in politics. Just... In fact, not just not influential, you, you, you have to be quiet. You have to seed you, you, you have to seed authority and and um insight and analysis to a class of people that only ever come in at the sweaty end of town to earn their wages before they go back to, you know it's that that whole thing of you know um well-paid people coming over at the east end to tell the kids that you know do, do, do you know you're poor do you want to draw a picture and tell us how you feel show us how you feel about that how does that make you feel you know let's let, let let's it's the political choices. You're absolutely right, Eva, because there's money there. There's nothing more that the pandemic has showed us that when we need to print money, we can. When we need to find money, we can. If the political will is there to do something and pay for it, we can find the money. Um, it's the choices about where we spend those resources and it's never where the need is. Or you, you, you said about the kind of, I suppose, that, that professional class of politician, um, and it's something that used to get said to me quite often is that, uh, you know, uh, you know, you're really quite good, but, you know, you should maybe change the way you speak. And you, now, now, like was all, I've got my work voice that, you know, and I, and I used to think, you know, maybe people will hear what I'm saying better if, you know, if I try to speak like them. But that's the whole point. The professionalisation of politics is to make people from communities like mine um, feel that we're not... Uh, I, I don't know, um, we're not able to speak for ourselves. We need to give that to middle men or middle women who are able to, who have no experience of everyday experience. Uh, they can speak for us. They can be on the boards and the parliaments and the committees that make the decisions for us. And it's not a lot of the, 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 the spin doctors and stuff that, and staffers that work for the, the SNP particularly, I've never had a job. They've never had a job outside of politics. They went straight from university to working for an MP or an MSP. They have no real knowledge of the issues that they're discussing. So it's all about sound bites, and that's why we have went down the route of identity politics so much. And I'm not a big fan of identity politics. I've got to say, I don't believe that any one group of people are, you know, more virtuous and good um, uh, just by being, you know, by being uh, a part of this particular group, and and this the, this group of people are all bad. You know, it's nuanced or shades of grey um, through through everything. I think though that the jargon and the kind of there's a, there's a snobbishness, and it's not even it's not even hidden as 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 those young people who've never had to juggle with competing interests, like do I put a dinner on the table or do I put money on the power card? Do I buy my own uh, shoes or do I take that trip on the bus to take them swimming? You're not talking about luxury choice, you, the competing interests about need. Um, so you're never able to deal with the wants. Um, I don't think that these people have got any experience of running a household budget, of bringing up kids. It doesn't make them bad people, but what it does make them is detached and aloof. Mm -hmm from the problems that they are tasked with solving. The representation on all of those boards, um, they're, they're, they're no diverse. They want to talk about is there, is there diversity in terms of ethnicity, which is also is important in terms of gender and in terms of you know, sexual preferences. What about class? Where, where, where is the representation? Where's the true diversity? Because whoever said, oh, there's, there's too many working class people wanting about that parliament, you know, with their, with their trainers on talking about poor housing, universal credit, and said no one ever, because these people are not visible. But the people are the majority of the country. They're the people that are paying the majority of the taxes. They're the workers that are earning the well, that are keeping the country going. So, well, you know, I, I don't feel that I need somebody to tell me how to make myself more um, acceptable to them. You know, uh, they can make themselves more acceptable to me. I'm done. I'm, 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 I'm done trying to, uh, uh, you know, wriggle about on the head of a pin, trying to find the right language. Um, you know, everybody knows what the problems are. Mm -hmm. Wales are hungry. In Dundee, uh, so, well, so we were talking about pensions, because it's at both ends of the scale. It's, it's, it's mm -hmm. child poverty, but it's also pensioner poverty. So in, in Scotland, we've got 150,000 pensioners. So that is equivalent to the population of Dundee living in persistent poverty. 14% of Scottish pensioners live in poverty and 12% in persistent poverty. Some of the powers that we're talking about earlier under that executive competence is as I said, the ability to mitigate, to top up um, uh, uh, benefits that we've now handed back to Westminster. 
One of those in particular is to do with the WASP women. Now we know that that, that responsibility for that the flawed policy lies at Westminster. But we've mitigated against many other things, like including the bedroom tax. We do, under that executive competence, we would have um, the, the, the power to, to top up, to make sure that Scottish women weren't in detriment as, as a result of that policy. Now, that doesn't suit, I suppose, the narrative of being able to uh, weigh the grievance for that at Westminster, where I feel you still can. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean we should leave Scottish pensioners or Scottish disabled people in desperate need while we make a political point. If we want to convince the majority of Scotland that we can run our country, we better start use, showing them how we can use the powers we already have to materially make life in Scotland better for people. Um, and I think that's the only way, you know, if, if we were going to say in 2014 we could be independent within two, uh, within two years, but that same government are saying six years later we can't even set up our own benefits agency. And that's with money and support um, from the UK government. What message are you sending out there? Use the powers you've got to show Scotland where you can make a material difference to the things that are affecting their day-to-day -day lives. You know, low, low, low paid work, low, um, poor housing, um, poor healthcare, poor educational attainment. These are things we can all start to work on now. And I think it's the responsibility of any devolved government to, to do that. So it's not just about what we can do with independence, it's what we can do now that we're not doing. I think we need to speak about that a lot more. No, Eva, uh, one of the reasons, if I can, you know, we go back to the days of Labour and New Labour. We kicked them out, we get angry with them because they had the power, all the power for so many years and they didn't bother looking after the working class and the people full of poverty. And we, used to, we told them how wrong it was mm -hmm. because they prioritised being in London or prioritised doing things for the union or prioritised doing anything except looking after their core support, the people in the working class areas of Scotland, of which there are many. Um, it is sad to say, I'm afraid the present government have abandoned the, the poor people and the poverty stricken people of Scotland. They're just as bad as the old Labour Party, or am I being unfair? They, they took them for granted, Rody. They, they, they took them for, if, you, if you look back in the referendum, when you were at the count and you were seeing the boxes coming in, all the boxes for the working class areas were, you know, they were full of yes votes. It's no surprise that those were the communities that were motivated. And they've to been abandoned. Change. The status quo. If if you were if you were if you if you were doing quite nicely, thank you, under the system as it was, you were, you were only motivated mm. to vote for change because the system was working for you. But the, the, in in the in the more um, deprived communities, the boxes were overwhelmingly um, yes. The issue I think then was then uh, when Nicola Sturgeon decided that her target audience were the soft nose and in pursuing the soft nose, she forgot about the hard yeses, the people that needed to see that change. Those people that still exist and need to see that change as a matter of urgency, not five years, six years after COVID. What happens after COVID? We're going to have a climate emergency. Is it going to be able to wait to the uh, climate emergency? So, there, and then we'll deal with independence. It's literally getting to the stage where, you know, when, when, when the sun um, sets in the east and rises in the west, and if we all stand on one leg looking north and we all jump up at the same time, look, look, stop telling us reasons why we can't have it. Start doing your job and tell us the reasons why we need to have it, we must have it, and how are you going to give us it? It's your job. Oh, we've got to take it. Eva, we can't wait for anyone to give us independence. We have to go and get it, do we not? We certainly do, Roddy, but the, the issue is, as Michelle says, it's one of timing. And, you know, we don't have the luxury of hanging about any longer. We've hung about for nope. far too long as it is. We've been static since 2014. Nothing's happened. Nothing's changed. People have just got comfortable. I don't know if they've got jaded or if they're scared or they're no interested or they're sidetracked or whatever it is. The effect's just the same. We've got, you know, the pandemic, thousands and thousands and thousands of people died because we had a four nations approach. Um, mm. You know, there's there's you know so much sadness and distress and hurt all tied up in all of that um why anybody in their right mind would say that we need to recover from the pandemic first before we address independence just defies all logic or you know understanding of human nature and um, let alone the ambitions of people that want to make this country you know a, a happy and a wealthy and a prosperous decent place to live in 
um, mm -hmm. why we think we've got to hang on to Westminster to get over the pandemic and that that somehow means that once it's all over and done with, we, we can then suddenly find the, the magic solution to walk away beats me. It, it, it's just yet another wee dangly carrot. Um, and either, yeah, it won't happen with a, it won't happen with a section thirty goodwill from England, and it won't happen with a referendum. We should be recalling all our MPs just now. Have a grand assembly in Scotland and declare our independence. We went into this apparently as an equal partner. We should leave it as an equal partner. We don't need anyone else's permission. We are a sovereign nation, well, ladies. We need, get, we need to get more bolshy than we've been. You know, you can't absolutely keep somebody and saying, "Oh, please go and give me this, pal." Um, it's not meant to work like that. They're no our friends. Westminster is no friend of Scotland, and we need to start realising that and getting that message out on a daily basis. Um, well, I've we... got to say, there's three bullshit people on this screen at the moment. <laughs> Maybe we need to get even more bullshit. Ladies, we've run out of time, believe it or not. It's been such a, a wonderful chat, and uh, we've overshot the runway a wee bit. <laughs> I'm sure Techie can Techie will work that one out. Um, let me thank you again. Uh, Ladies, it's been as always a pleasure and never a chore. Um, enjoy conference and let's hope everything goes smooth at conference. COVID's a worry, but let's hope it all goes well. And uh, um, we'll have you back after conference and you can tell me if it met with your expectations. Well, and you enjoy your holiday in Dubai. Grandkids, and I get spoiled. I love it. It's great. Well, <laughs> good. I'm happy you're having some time with your grandkids. Right, my friends, I will see you soon. Thank you again. Bye-bye. God bless. You. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did in talking to Eva and Michelle. Um, passion, loads of passion. Uh, and I, I wish I could find someone to disagree with, but I couldn't. I wish we didn't have to discuss it. But to discuss the week and what's been going on and other things, I'm now joined by two of my my my, my favourite gentlemen as well. Of the, and I'm the... The, the Gareth Grousebeater himself and Phil Boswell, SNP, XMP, who are here to join me for the week for a wee chat. Gentlemen, as always, lovely to see you. Are you all keeping well? Howdy, yes, all well. As, so should... as well as can be expected. And, again, yeah, yeah. and uh, counter to all predictions. I'm still here. Yeah, yes, yeah. You. You're looking healthier than a lot of people I know. <laughs> you're looking very healthy, my friend. People keep um, uh, bumping into me and saying, "But you look so healthy." <laughs> well, yeah, you, 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 to say you than, scrub uh, up well. You scrub up well. You to death. <laughs> what was that line? Uh, reports of my death have been greatly over exaggerated. That's, that's something exactly, like paraphrase. That's exactly it. I've even confounded <laughs> it. <laughs> My medical, my medical consultant. But uh, it's been quite a week, guys. We've got a few things I'd like to talk to you about and get your opinions on. And very valid opinions they always are. And as long insight. as you're not asking for a loan, Roddy, I'm fine with it. Well, you're not, you're not sending me a check for letting you be on here. <laughs> take, no, it, take him no out. Donations. <laughs> uh, the last time I cut a check for a donation was a thousand pounds for the SNP. Uh, and I'm, I'm regretting it. Yeah. Uh, it was right at the time, I'm sure, Gareth. Uh, the right thing to do. Yeah, and I've got a standing ovation. I thought, well, that's nice. I'll cut another one. <laughs> give me a thousand quid and I'll give you a standing ovation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's been talking of that. Uh, First Minister's questions this week. Um, Nicola was, in, uh, was asking a very serious question. She'd been asked by Pauline McNeil about sectarianism in school, and, and Nicola, um, who I can't be very critical of, was giving a very valid and decent answer, saying, you know, anyone was welcome, blah, blah, blah. When a Tory, Tessa White, or Tess White, shouted from the back, unless you're English, you're not welcome in Scotland. Quite disgusting, Gareth, isn't it? I mean, that... Well, that, it's, uh, it's a bit uh, counterintuitive. Uh, she's actually sitting in the Scottish Parliament, <laughs> yeah. Now, how did you get there if you wasn't welcome? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I uh, mean, that's, that's the irony, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's, well, it's, it's, tech, it's it another bit... way of uh, shutting down discussion. Uh, I always ask people, is there another country governing Scotland other than England? Because if there is, I need to be told. <laughs> 
Uh, uh, you, you know, there isn't any way you can criticise the English government without discussing English people and uh, their values and their political ambitions. Isn't it when she isn't said it? that, I, I, I tweeted that she should, she, should, she should have been told that, you know, it's colonial Brits that we're annoyed by um, and that we would like to go home, um, especially if they're Scottish because they are obviously house jocks who would feel much more comfortable living somewhere in uh, uh, verdant green Merry England. Mm. Yeah, I've got no embarrassment. I, like the Irish, uh, I remember I'm half Irish, I don't have any embarrassment about using phrases like arrogant Englishmen because they're damn well everywhere. Um, mm. the, Eng uh, the English Parliament, uh, for that is what Westminster is, assumes that if the Tories win an election by uh, England vote alone, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland um, are automatically part of uh, England's territory. And uh, they really should stop that. Uh, it isn't an automatic right to govern the other nations and provinces. Um, so that's that's kind of that's the kind of way I, I look at it, you know. Um, I try to take a general view. Uh, and yeah, I mean, and there's so many examples of that, Gareth, as well. When you're looking at my mum's English, right, and I was a, one of the SNP's MPs, and my mother voted to re voted for ag against independence initially, but now she's completely turned round, and she's technically English. But that, that's not what matters. What I loved about the SNP of old was that mantra that it's we're working for the people who live and work in Scotland. Do you know that? Yes. That's important. Now, there's another dimension. I don't know if we're going to come on to that when we look at Alf, the, the professor's work, Alf Baird. Mm -hmm. And we, I think that's very interesting, that particular um, group within United Nations and within Europe who are looking at a whole philosophy of the decolonization of states and areas. That's a fascinating subject. Maybe it's subject for another day. But there's absolutely no doubt this is this is this is glib sound bites, deliberately divisive as the Brits have always done. And I'm sitting here in colonial what was colonial India in Chennai, which was Madras Madras, I'm just south of it. And it's the the, the telltale signs are all there. You know, they they're too polite to mention how they were raped and pillaged by the Brits, but you look at the history of the East India, India Company. 45 incredible. trillion under the British oh. rule. But isn't well, it's incredible. There's, there's a brilliant, there's there's a brilliant a, politician. There's a irony called. here that the Tory party who hate Johnny Foreigner, who took a, you know, did a Brexit because <laughs> they hate the foreigners, complaining because they think someone hates them. I mean, they've got well, an correct. Well, there's a guy, Tarish Tarur, I think is his name is. I've, I've, I've obviously got, uh, probably screwing up the name. But an uh, extremely articulate, intelligent man. And he, there's, his, his books are fascinating. There's one where he pointed out that India in 1700 had 27, 28% of world GDP. Prior to Britain really getting its, its hands around it, it had a GDP of 23%. The world's GDP was based in India. You had plenty of the elder reporting that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, plenty of the elder in Roman times were saying too much of gold's, of Rome's gold was being passed to India for the fine linens and muslins, etc., because Indian women loved it. And you're now in a situation when, in, when Britain left in 47, which we aspire to, to becoming independent, as India did in 47, you had 3% of GDP with a literacy rate, rate in the single figures. There was an American scholar visited who said, the, the the British funding or budget for education in the whole of India was less than New York City's mm. in the early in the thirties. I mean, it, it's this is how the system works, and this is how it works if you stay within a system and a regime that was set up by the British, including Scots. Yep. But we are certainly my, no beneficiaries uh, now. My English cousins have never gotten over the Battle of Hastings. That changed <laughs> that changed everything for them. You know, well, that's because they're French people Norman, that can't speak you know, French. They, they, <laughs> they came in and they're ruling, they're ruling almost poor Saxons. So, yeah. Um, oh, and they Norman do their best French. to forget Magna Carta. You know, the, the, uh, Phenomenal. It's amazing how much of it they've just dismissed and dispelled. And 
the, a few academics talk about it with reverence, but they, they don't actually they don't actually stick to the book anymore. So uh, the quicker we uh, cut their ship loose from our dock, the better, if I could put it that yep. way. Yep. Well. While this effrontery was going on inside Holyrood, uh, Gareth, outside there was a, a protest by uh, women, women's rights groups. Um, and what I found quite disturbing was uh, um, some people referring to these women defending their rights as fascists, as far right, alt right, um, because women were just there to defend their, their rights, their hard won rights. Um, and one of them was an SNP elected or appointed, appointed, not elected, appointed officer. I was quite disgusted. Did you notice that one? Uh, the women were dressed up, uh, weren't they? Um, suffragettes. Uh, uh, suffragettes in 1920s, which is very theatrical. Uh, and uh, 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 it's a kind of fear. Uh, when I was younger, dark haired and looking 100% Italian, uh, Sicilian. Uh, people used to think I owned a, a sports car. <laughs> they would say, oh, you're the kind of guy that's got a sports car. So a lot, a lot goes by appearances. But uh, it, the worst possible thing is to take on uh, Scottish women in anything. I mean, they're incredibly fierce. I, uh, in case there's any producers out there looking <laughs> watching this when you put it out. I wrote a script called Clearance. I'll have to change that title because um, it sounds like, you know, a, a house sale. Uh, to some extent, it was selling houses. Uh, and I based it um, on a group of women up in Grunard who protected their village from uh, uh, comprehensive eviction. The men were all away. Their husbands were away in the Boer War, and so they were left to defend themselves against the clearances, uh, which they did very successfully for a few weeks, including uh, 20 pretty thuggish Glasgow <laughs> Glasgow policemen. <laughs> See, even back then, Scots were sent, you know, <laughs> to remove other Scots uh, from uh, the struggle. And they, uh, uh, they managed to hold off the police and send them packing. I don't want to give too much away because uh, the script one day uh, might actually get made. Uh, however, uh, the point I'm trying to make is uh, the, the psyche of Scots women is incredibly fierce. I mean, I'm married to one who's <laughs> a Creef lassie, you know, uh, who knows the Highlands better than some of the Highlanders. Uh, and um, she's a feminist. She believes in the feminist movement. She knows what it's like to uh, be talented, but in a man's, a male environment. And she's managed to succeed because she learned how you handle men. And I keep seeing women who haven't actually matured to that level. They just haven't learned <laughs> how to work the process how to put men down, you know, with a comment or a say. But I understand there are some women uh, who will always be timid. You know, it doesn't matter how much they learn. Uh, when faced by aggressive men, they will always be timid. But I couldn't, I couldn't understand why the women making a peaceful protest outside our parliament, a very good thing to do, uh, were being actually attacked by other Scottish women, uh, as if it was a heinous crime. Uh, and that's uh, the British state at work. That's not Scotland at work. That's the British state uh, sending people in to say, look, make a mess of all this. You know, make it look as though there are doubters. You know, there are, there's a, there's the, uh, these women don't represent Scotland. Well, um, I can remember reading up um, in my history classes at university about the suffragettes and what men said about them then. And I'm hearing similar things uh, happening now. So uh, I just find it really sad that um, 
uh, women who are trying to make their voices heard to their own elected representatives should be denigrated and vilified. Yeah, shocking. Shocking. Um, but it's, uh, it's just one of the many problems that we have. And, uh, and one of the other things that's really going wrong for, um, particularly we, we, I discussed it earlier with the ladies, poverty. Women have to usually carry the brunt of poverty more than more than men. Uh, and, and that is an issue that, you know, I think we've covered earlier, but it's, it's something we have to go over. Um, but what, another thing that's really been going on this week that I really want to discuss, because time's always an enemy in this show, and I'm sure you guys have got lots to say, and that's the David Clegg book. <laughs> um, the retrial, Mark 4, is it? Mark 3 of the innocent Alex Salmon. It, it, it just keeps going on, Phil. Um, it's absurd. Absolutely nonsense. Just just before we move on to that, because I know it's critical, on what the ladies were saying, I was listening in, and what what grates most is that I'm in India, right? And um, the 2000 UN target, there was 200 targets, and Bjorn Lomborg listed them all. And the UN said, we're going to <clears throat> try to half abject poverty in the world by 2015. I've mentioned this before. Everybody says, you'll never do it. It was achieved in 2013. So all around the world, in India, China, all over the planet, child poverty is decreasing, and yet it's increasing in Scotland. Mm -hmm. It's increasing in Scotland, and the question is, why is our government, even it's devolved, it still has powers, and I, I, I hear the, there was talk about economic levers they were talking about. There's about 35 fiscal and monetary levers you need to operate an economy properly. You need control of those or you're just a bit player. And that's the game that's being played by Westminster. But that aside, within the powers that you do have, they ought to be used. And why are we prioritising GRA and hate crime when more of our children are getting to poverty? Not exactly. acceptable. Not acceptable. No. And anyway, back to the book. <clears throat> Appalling. Appalling. This never... This... This this raises a very... I think it's a betrayal of, of women. And I'm not... I'm not jumping on the bus here. I'm angry for two reasons. One, there is the fact that what people don't understand, the only equity that I believe in is equity in the eyes of the laws. That's where that's where people deserve to be treated equitably, absolutely, in the eyes of the law. Doesn't matter if you're rich, poor, black, white, what religion you are, you should be treated fairly in the eyes. And that has been undermined disgracefully in Scotland, including by the Crown Office and certain protagonists. <clears throat> but what we're getting women who go through the horrendous experience of rape, and I'm in, I'm in the rape capital of the world, tragically, uh, what we're giving women is the right to anonymity. Now, we say right, but in truth, it's a privilege that's granted. It's a privilege that we've granted these women that our society quite rightly agrees that we should give these women anonymity. And the women that have abused that anonymity not only are betraying the women who are properly and genuinely victims, but they are undermining the very, the, 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 what once was respected as the greatest legal system on the planet. Scots law is, was renowned throughout the world. It's becoming a laughing stock. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gareth, you're a man of thought and you're able to analyse things. What I, uh, have you made of this book? I used to sign doing? my emails uh, to my two daughters, uh, Papa, you know, uh, which is uh, I thought was kind of Italian. And then quite recently uh, I wrote to one of them, I said, look, you're a bit old now and I'm really old uh, to be calling me Papa, uh, so I'm just going to sign my letters and emails to you, Gareth. And one of them wrote back and said, you don't decide that, Dad. I, I'll decide that. <laughs> She's right. <laughs> and she, was, she was spot on. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, I'm just thinking about that book and Clegg, um, the, the so-called journalist and editor, uh, worming his way to um, uh, a, a red velvet cloak and the airman shoulders uh, uh, who had the 
uh, sleazy assignation with Liz Lloyd and then um, leaked the salmon, the government salmon papers to the press. Just a coincidence. Pure, pure and absolute coincidence. The two happened to meet at the same place at the same time and, and that was the outcome. Yeah. So uh, I suppose we're giving publicity to the book and uh, I would like to see it remainder very quickly, you know, on Amazon for uh, new copies at one pound. I think it's currently being sold for about fourteen pounds hardback. Uh, yeah, I mean, but it has a, buy it. It has a totally misleading title, you know. How Alex Salmond went to war with Nicholas uh, Sturgeon, but he didn't. She went to war with, with him. She was the cause of the problem. And you either see it. There, there seems to be uh, opinion seems to have broken into two schools of thought. And one is that it was a conspiracy, you know, led by uh, our First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, uh, uh, sometimes by proxy, sometimes by um, behind the doors instruction. And then other people like me uh, who think that it uh, shows her weakness, that she allowed this thing to gather momentum until it became, you know, the cause celebre of Scotland and the... Uh, 21st century. Uh, she has actually left a terrible stain on Scotland's history. Um, and it's not about her. I don't care if she was worried about it, it's given her sleepless nights. She should never have let it get to that level where it went to the high court. But luckily, the jury, uh, the people who sat there were determined that the British state was not going to crucify one of their champions. And they listened to the evidence and they rejected the lies and exaggerations. I'm pleased to say. Uh, well, it's just, a pity. The it's just a pity that Craig Murray didn't have a jury because I don't think he'd be yes. sitting in a... In a That's an absolute disgrace. Yeah, that absolute if, if Alec didn't have a jury, would he be in jail now? That was going to be my yes. next question. Yes. Yes, it would be. And just touching on a couple of things that uh, Gareth said during earlier, you mentioned, Gareth, it's a propaganda book, which is exactly what it is. It's a propaganda book in the true sense of the word. Alex Salmon didn't bring this on. He was attacked. There's two court cases that are not publicised. One against Liz Lloyd and, well, anyway, maybe we shouldn't, I shouldn't mention names, but two high-profile figures involved in the situation with Alex are um, been taken to court by Alex Salmon's legal team. And Alex at the time said that hopefully this will be it. This will be, there'll be no need for any more. Sadly, this book, propaganda book, is evidence that this is not going away. They will not finish unless they destroy him. The, what, the damage that has been done to his reputation with reasonable people that an intelligent people who say, well, no smoke without fire. Them. How can 13 women say this? Or it's not 13 women, it's eight with 13 charges. But the problem is the anonymity not only protects the women who are abusing the system in this case, but it also means that the evidence is not presented to the people in a, in a way that people can make their own objective decisions. And that is scurrilous. That is unacceptable in a civilized society. We've come a long way, haven't we, from the uh, camaraderie and openness of the 24th yes, campaign for the, yeah, for the referendum vote. Um, that unity, I mean, this, this is where the fascism, the comment you made earlier about, I mean, I, 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 an elected or appointed, as you quite rightly pointed out, MSP stated that, um, they don't don't join in with the, the fascists. I mean, seriously, seriously. Well, my weekend essay uh, published um, late last night is called SMP and Fascism, where I'm <laughs> just trying to have a look at wonderful. How, how much of their uh, SMP output is fascistic and how much is um, just authoritarianism. You know, whether they're, yeah, they're saying, look, we're in power, we'll make the decisions, not you. Uh, I think the SNP have forgotten that the people are sovereign. And that's the high SNP hierarchy yes. because you know life isn't as black and white as that. 
um, uh, there are sophistications. And as some one of the women said earlier that you had here, you know, there are nuances. There are good people within the SNP. There's one now uh, trying to get uh, trying to talk the uh, SNP headquarters into an apology for uh, what they said about me in order to silence uh, my voice. And, and the strange thing was that up until that point, I hadn't been critical of SNP policy at all, and especially not um, Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, I had praised her, although there were I had some reservations, uh, one of which was she seemed inexperienced to take on such a job. But you, you hope that such people will somehow grow into it. You know, the yes. states person will come to the front eventually, just just out of the way they have to handle all the problems. But, but that has well, never that has never happened. And I look at the majority. I didn't criticize um, Nicola Sturgeon for about four years. Um, uh, I, I used diplomacy, you know, like. Um, uh, she's rushing off to look after Brexit, which is a 100% English issue. Yep. Um, our baby boxes can't be the only thing that she's credited with, um, uh, even though she got the idea from Alex Salmond, who probably got the idea from Finland. Finland. Um, so there are you know, a whole lot of uh, things that I avoided, uh, unlike um, Stuart Campbell, the editor of Wings, uh, who just went straight for the jugular. <laughs> God bless him. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. Swinging, uh, it, swinging it, it, his clipboard in all directions um, until he, he, he eventually found that there was a, a counter reaction uh, to his website and uh, people, uh, his, his tormentors successfully got his Twitter site closed down. Uh, this is, well, this, is saying, Scotland. this is the enlightenment of Scotland of the 21st century. This is uh, post enlightenment. As, this is no longer the enlightenment of Scotland. That is long since gone. And giving a little bit of insight from the inside as an XMP and part of the, the, the 56, there's a couple of points. We went down and as I said before, uh, you know, we were, I think Yorkshire had 53 or 54. We could outvote them, but that was it. We, we, we'd nothing, there's nothing we can do. We should be a vote. We should be looking at Sinn Féin are doing. That's what we should be doing. But on the point of, um, what we were talking about there, what, what influence can we actually bring to bear here? What, what are we doing about, about, oh, sorry, there's, sorry, I'm getting a lot of feedback. I need, take, take it on a wee minute. I need to stop something. Hold on. Uh, uh, <laughs> I've been caught for words here. There you go. Keep going, Phil. Sorry. He's, back, got, back all, he's, he's got a whole lot of children around him there I, wait, waiting, for, I have. waiting for him well, to throw speaking of which, at them. <laughs> well, it's it's fantastic. So, sorry, where were we? What were we on there? It was we were talking <clears> about. You were talking about the fifty-six M MPs and the lack of influence, and that we should be abstaining, or we should be. I mean, I'm agree. I, I would pull them out of Westminster tomorrow. In fact, that's why I originally fell out with Pete Wisher because I said, "You get yourselves out of there. You're doing no good, and they aren't doing yeah. any good. They haven't no, we're not. An we or anything passed. Never but, will. But the but point this, it was making. This is the way we accommodate. Uh, the colonial, it's, it's, you know, we, we eventually we, 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 we eventually learn how to live with them. Sorry, Phil, carry on. No, 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 and it's how you go in when you, you, you suddenly get in all these grand vizier of underwater basket weaving or all these stupid titles that we started accepting, which is an absolute nonsense and, and we shouldn't be playing that. But what I'm talking about here is the loyalty. There's two sides to loyalty in a party. I am in this, but this is my party. This was your party, gentlemen. And you put more in it than most of the the, the recent new newbies that have that have showed up and, and adopted. There's... there's, there's Loyalty is to be valued in any political party, in any organization, but there's a limit. There's a limit. The best organizations, organizations reward truth speakers. Oppressive organizations or systems jail whistleblowers. And that is where we are right now. When we went down to Westminster in 56, we were respected for our regimented, disciplined, all singing the same chant. Now, there's a positive to that and there's a negative to that. And that should be obvious to anyone who's studied 20th century history with even even a casual glance at it. You, you understand that loyalty and blind loyalty is cultish and of religion. 
in political parties, just read Solzhenitsyn, read Orwell, read Dostoevsky, and you know where that kind of blind loyalty takes you. I respect loyalty, I want it in a party, but when their lines are crossed, where are the lines? When do we go too far? And the women touched upon it earlier. I mean, when I was listening to Eve and Michelle, they, they touched on the core of this. Our members are elected to represent the majority. GRA is what, 0.04% of the population when more children are getting into poverty, more people are struggling with, get, get your priorities right. That's what you're, that's what we're elected for. That's why we elect these people. And most of them are put in place. These are not geniuses. Most people, most of the MPs, I'll be honest, that I worked with are not impressive. Hmm. Most, most of the people I meet in business, I mean, what if, look at Hamza. Hamza, he's, he's got his degree, he's not a stupid man. But he's got no experience as justice in justice. He's got no experience in health, and yet he's the secretary. What the hell is going on here? What's wrong with putting people who actually know something? You, you, and, and there's no excuse for it. Joanna Cherry, a QC, why is she no longer representing us down in London on the very, as an advocate, she's a QC, for God's sake. <laughs> and you've got somebody, probably one of the smartest, um, Philippa Whitford, health. I mean, my God, she's a surgeon for God's sake. You know, at least she got that. But this is what we should be, we should be putting. Break this mould, break this career politician mould. And let's get people who understand what's going on. Again, something that I think it was particularly Michelle, both Eve and Michelle mentioned it. <clears throat> do, do you understand? Are you a rich, well-paid, middle-class person wandering into the ghetto saying, how do you feel about this? Well, let's do something about it. What about... I mean, if you read Poverty, was it Poverty Safari? Great book about um, a troubled young man, and it's, it's shocking me that his, his names were out of my head for a wee minute. Um, it's worth checking out. We should put a link on it. Great book, very insightful when he was right on the ball about what the reality about living from an impoverished background in modern Scotland is all about and, and what you face. And it ain't... It ain't about going and doing a philosophical or a philosophy degree or a psychology degree and getting in and fixing it. It's about getting down to brass tacks and understanding what people need, need to make the, the leverage we need. To, I mean, one of the things they mentioned was the um, the children's welfare allowance. Why are we not spending it on children's? What, you've got you've got GRA and hate crimes sponsored by institutions that were noble. I mean, let's not forget where some of these institutions that are currently f on, on gay rights, Stonewall, was right. I supported Stonewall, happy to support it when it was doing what it was doing. But when they achieve their prime directive, then they look, do they close down? No, they look for other missions. And this is where they wander into areas that, what are you doing in trans rights with 0 0.004? Nothing wrong with standing up for it. But why are you getting a million pounds from the government to finance this and representation on NEC and making this a priority over child poverty, which affects the whole country and a whole society? Hmm. No, you're not on. No uh, except. Um, is there enough of uh, the public in Scotland aware of the excesses of the GRA uh, reforms? No. I, I still meet women, you know, who are shocked when I tell them. <clears throat> that uh, one of the outcomes was a, a drag artist in a primary school. Uh, they can't believe it. And uh, I, you know, I have to show them some sort of evidence that that actually happened. So I, I think people are pretty ill-informed about the consequences of some of the policies that the SNP are uh, pushing like mad and, of course, now joined up with the Greens uh, to make life easier for them. But. Uh, I see that as a, a shaky alliance, particularly since they've lost the, but the only brains that they had in Andy Whiteman, sure. uh, who decided to chuck it, the towel in with the Scottish Greens. Yeah. Gentlemen, we're coming towards the end, um, regrettably, because especially you know you guys, I could sit here for the rest of the day. But um, one thing I'd like to go on about, which I think is... Um, Repetitive, but is worrying that for the fourth year in the trot, uh, Angus McNeil and others who have tried to get um, an amendment discussed at Plan B, at, yeah, Plan B at conference and the conference committee. No, we don't want to talk about independence. That 
I think it says all we need to know about the USNP, Gareth. They don't even want to debate as independence. Uh, yeah, that's uh, for those who've uh, devoted their life. It must be crushing. Uh, uh -huh. uh, who have devoted their life to that cause? It must be uh, crushing to hear the, the one party that was dedicated to it saying, "Now is not the time." I mean, that's what I mean about them um, uh, uh, expressing a colonial mentality. Bought and sold. Um, our, our first minister. Her mind is colonized. She would disagree with it, and I can hear her making a snarky comment at me right now as I say that. Uh, but she is. Uh, she and the SNP are happy to accommodate whatever uh, Boris feels is important. Uh, she might bang the table a few times, say this is this is unacceptable, this is not right. But in the end, she still has to do whatever comes from London. So. Uh, the, uh, the the development that, that will not talk about independence. <laughs> Let's leave the talk of independence to our opponents, <laughs> who, who are probably far more uh, skilled at it. Could I correct you in one thing, Gareth? You say I she sure. has to do what London tells her. No, she chooses to do what London tells her. She should be actually doing cutting her uh, cutting her own um, furrow. Uh, instead of doing what they tell her, instead of this four, even she said she wanted a four nation decision on Scottish oil. What? I mean, that, that's, that, I, I'm an oil man, and uh, and I know how how using this resource properly can benefit Scotland moving forward in the transition into greener more, or, or renewable energies. It, it, we know how to do it. You know, the, look at how. What, no, I worked for Statoil. I know how the Norwegians have done it with every barrel counts and uh, a one trillion plus in growing and multiplying uh, sovereign wealth fund for the people. But what gets me about the Plan B? It's rejection of Plan B and instead implementing hiring David Harvey for the Crown Office, giving three million to the mainstream media. Evans, husband, XMI5, all the activities and actions by your leadership in the, in the SNP seem to be, see, I, I don't mind. I don't mind if you're doing all of this to bring people in because that was the SNP. What's what we used to be? The broad church, inclusive, talk to everyone, no deep platforming. You speak to the right, you speak to the left, and everybody gets a say and everybody gets listened. If we were moving towards independence, pragmatically i wouldn't mind i'd be happy to have anyone on board anyone who's willing to contribute but the fact that we're getting people who have who've worked against independence into the system and we seem to be reversing away from it that's why my party and you what used to be your party this is those that are in there and we are still the majority in spite of those that have left we, this is a wonky tail that's wagging this dog and it will break off at some point, I don't, and, I, and I'm not for excluding anybody. These voices have to be heard. The far left has to be heard. The far right has to be heard. Because you certainly don't want to lose sight of the far right. You know, you want to know who they are and where they are. You don't want them going underground for one. But certainly, it needs to be more inclusive. And just for a finish, Camly, can you come over for a wee minute? <clears throat> this, this is a wee sign. This is something that's happening here. This is hashtag Mahab Surfers. Come on, Camly, come over and stand in here. Camelie's an 11-year-old skateboarder surfer. Say hello, that's you in the, that's you in the screen, Camelie. And she's a celebrity here just south of Chennai. And she's working with the, the, the hashtag Mahab Surfers. So you want to tell them what Mahab Surfers and what you want to do with life? Uh, this is this is an impoverished village, and there's some brilliant people here who do some magnificent work that we we should be copying. On you go. Hello. Welcome to Through a Scottish Prism. Hello. Uh, Don't be shy. Sorry. Just say hello and uh, tell them what you're going to do. You're going to be a surfer, aren't you? Yeah, I'm going to be a surfer and a skateboarder. And uh, And you don't have any new boards, it's only second hand boards. Uh, I love to get my half boy surfboard and uh, they love to go to Sri Lanka, but uh, they don't have sponsors. Yeah, need and sponsors. need sponsors, yeah. Yeah, no worries, Cal. 
Thanks very you much. might just find you get lucky in that, sweetheart. Thanks, Cali. Well, you know, um, the, 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 we we things like this. This this what this village. This is a village, south of Chennai, and there's an Irish woman here who's helping these people understand, um, and and get sponsorship. They don't have any new surfboards. How do you get out of poverty? You know, we we came out of poverty and well, we're pressing back into it. What is what's it all about? My wife and I used to visit uh, the south of Spain a lot. And uh, you would go up into these tiny villages to find that they've got uh, internet, <laughs> where Scottish villages still haven't got an aerial within a hundred <laughs> miles of them, you know. And they've got nice Crazy. tarmac roads to get to get to the village, uh, all supplied by the European Union. Of course. So uh, yeah, they're they're more enlightened in Europe than <laughs> they are in Britain, where you know we've we've been uh, completely surrounded by uh, Boris and his Tories uh, who have cut us off from the West and the East and so we, we can only trade with England and even then they forgot that they don't have the truck drivers uh, yeah, to bring the terms. goods back and forward. Yeah. Gentlemen, we have come to the end of our time, sadly. Um, as all oh, don't say it like that. That has meaning for me. <laughs> <laughs> and all of us, Gavin, yeah, Gareth, sorry, I mean, who knows? <laughs> I can hear, I can hear the church bell ringing right now. <laughs> no, no, not me. I have decided to go age one hundred, shot by a jealous husband. That's my preferred. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I may very well go out with a pissing into a bag strapped to my side, but I will be flying a burning Spitfire. That much I guarantee. Uh, that's good. Well, that's I, good. can I just say for all that? Um, I hope <laughs> next time I speak to you, you're still in the SNP. Um, no, listen, I'm, 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 we should sure be able to speak be. the truth. It's, it's my vintage. party. Well, we I belong like to it. Criticism no, no, is listen, not we've like... got to accept it. How else we can don't. we straighten up and fly right? Yeah. You know they don't. But anyway, thank you um, for being so transparent and uh, telling us who it is. And to you, Gareth, my friend, as always, 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 tremendous to see you. Yep. And uh, I shall see you all soon. And to you, my viewers, I hope you've enjoyed um, today, as much as I have, with four very, very special people. And I will be back next week, hopefully, with some more special people. But until then, please, please, take care. Slanger. Thanks, Roddy. Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy.